Hope everybody's feeling well. One of the uh, fourth questions in the uh, three questions of the daily stand-up is, how are you feeling today? How many people asked that question? This is about uh, agile and people, and we're all people. I think we're mostly all agile. Uh, it's not about what agile is. Naresh once worked at ThoughtWorks and we worked together. Uh, my first agile class in India was with Naresh. Uh, thank you, Naresh, for that experience and introduction to India. Maybe each of you would like to say, just in one minute introduce yourselves uh, rather than my introducing you. And uh, why don't you start, Scott, uh, we, or, and we can just pass the mic around. My name is Scott Ambler. I'm the chief methodologist for IT at IBM Rational. And I get to go around the world helping people to improve the way that they work and uh, understand what they're doing and uh, hopefully understand the very serious trade-offs that they're making while they're doing all this good stuff. So I get, I get to help a lot of companies to understand and scale Agile and Lean and other stuff. So that's what I do. I'm Naresh. Uh, I'm a struggling startup uh, entrepreneur, and that's what I do. Good morning, friends. I'm Sujata Balakrishnan, heading India operations for Valtech from delivery side. And uh, my passion is Agile and people. And definitely we have done a lot of stuff in the last five, six years to really evangelize uh, from traditional to uh, Agile. And it's been working very well. And, um, and trust is the one thing which is, which is the one which is driving us to this extent. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Rebecca Parsons, the uh, CTO of ThoughtWorks. Uh, my particular passion is around um, Agile and the large. Uh, what does it really mean to uh, actually have Agile working across an entire enterprise? And there's an entire different set of problems, including uh, those, those wonderful individuals called enterprise architects, as well as, as um, standards organizations and such. And so that's where I focus a, a great deal of my time. I, uh, my name is Brett George. Uh, I am a person who generate, generates the chaos that creates the change that you just heard about how to handle. So uh, I create these problems. So we've got some troublemakers here. We've got some thought leaders. Uh, we have people who I've all met at one point in my life. And it's a real honor to get to spare, spend some time together uh, tackling some tough questions. So the first question I wanted to ask uh, the panelists uh, is, is Agile democratic? And in uh, some more detail, what form of government best uh, describes Agile decision making? Is it uh, democratic, hierarchic, totalitarian, uh, anarch an anarchistic? Uh, is it uh, consensus driven or is it kind of a chaotic, unpredictable process? Uh, I'd like each speaker to take about a minute and if, if a, per a speaker has the same response as one has already spoken, just pass the uh, mic to the other person. Uh, we also would like to get questions from you, and there are two people who will be helping us with that. If you have questions, uh, as time goes by, raise your hand. We won't pass a mic, but someone will come to you with the three by five card. You can write the question down, and we'll collect them here. And as time permits, we'll ask questions that you, uh, you've posed. Who'd like to uh, start with that question about is Agile Democratic? OK. Um. Well, I, I actually think in a very real way, uh, decision making um, most resembles a benevolent dictatorship um, in, if, if you're looking at actual existing forms of government. And the reason I think that is that although it should be informed decisions, and that's where the benevolence comes in, um, in, in reality there is a, a, an individual or a steering committee that is ultimately making the decisions about how the project will proceed. Now, hopefully, that decision is informed properly by all of the inputs from the individuals in, in the team. And I actually think that the input process on a properly functioning Agile team um, is the most robust. But in general, you will have some individual or, dare I say it, and, and I shudder when I say it, committee uh, that is actually making the, the final decisions based on their weighing of the evidence that's been presented to them. Actually, I, I, would, I would agree with uh, what she just said. You need a, almost a tyrant to make a change in an organization, somebody who's going to make that. But uh, Womack and Jones talk about it in the book called Lean Thinking, 
that tyrants are always shot. And so uh, after the change is in place, the person probably injecting that change will probably need to leave the organization. At that point, the change becomes self-sustaining. We're at that new higher level of performance. And at that point, I think a different level of governance comes in place. Uh, I'm seeing within, within companies I work with that we call this anarchy because they basically rule themselves. And that seems to be working really well after the change has been injected. I would like to bring in a different perspective. When you really look at people and agile, I really bring in customer also into this whole discussion. If you look at customer, I think that partially they are democratic because most of the time we think of them as customer as king and you need to do everything, whatever they ask. And we have very, amount, very little amount of resistance to say we can't do it. I think from that aspect, they have an higher hand to really dictate what they want to do. And still the agile team has to do in a collaborative way and deliver research. I think this is my viewpoint on is agile democratic. So I've, I've worked with uh, startup founders who are extremely dictative about to the detail that the first discussion starts with what algorithm we're going to implement before even you know what product you're actually making. And uh, it's, it's quite uh, interesting because uh, from the background I came from working with agile teams, uh, I always thought that it's extremely democratic. Everybody gets in the room and we vote and we you know, make the process as far as even deciding people's salary and stuff like that. But when I work for some of these startup companies which are extremely successful, it just hit me in my head. It's like, wow, what I was thinking all this while that you know, democratic way of running companies is you know, the best way to do it actually might not always work. So you know, I, I go back to Steve. Uh, Steve is a great example. Steve Jobs, by the way. Uh, Steve Jobs is a great example of uh, not being really, you know, people call him, he's the new Hitler in the software world. And uh, he's done some amazing things without necessarily having to be really democratic. So I, w I would conclude saying that you don't have to be democratic. Uh, and it really depends on your context. The analogy I like to use is from Star Trek, and because it's from Star Trek, you know it must be right. And, <laughs> and if you remember Star Trek The Next Generation, at the beginning of every episode, there'd be some crisis, almost always. So the very first thing that would happen is Picard would say, to the ready room. So the senior staff would all go off to the ready room, and they would have some moral discussion about you know, whatever issue they were trying to, trying to deal with at the time. And the interesting thing about that was that it, it, allowed, it allowed them to share their ideas to, in a respectful manner. Um, to, and, and it was interesting because they all had different styles. Because Worf would always say, we, got to, we need to blow them out of the sky. And, and Worf was only li listened to twice, by the way. Well, he was listened to, but his advice was only acted on twice the entire series. And if you, you, know, if you want to really get in trivial. And the, and the interesting thing, so Picard would listen to all this. And then he would say, OK, now this is what we're going to do. And the entire team would rally around that. And, it's, and it would usually work out. But, um, and there would be twists and turns, because otherwise you wouldn't have a 60-minute episode. But the, it, but the team would get behind it. Uh, and, and sometimes Picard would do something, would suggest something that he didn't really hear um, from everybody. You know, it, it piece the, piece the, the scenario together, and they would go forth and do the strategy, and, and things would generally work out, because you know, it was Star Trek, and everything works out in the 24th century. So, that, I think, so, so keep that in mind, and if you've, never, if you've never watched Star Trek The Next Generation, then, you know, um, you can download it. But anyways, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. So I'll answer the question myself. Uh, I think that there are elements of different kinds of government uh, in Agile, but common elements are it's about freedom, empowerment, uh, collaboration, uh, working together better in a collaborative way. So it's not about command and control to me. Uh, it's clear roles and responsibilities, so if you practice Scrum, the product owner has responsibility to prioritize and provide a budget, as Rebecca was mentioning this morning in the, uh, the business side, and the team has responsibility for estimations and for how they're going to do the work, and the team is usually working in a, in a collaborative, uh, uh, anarchistic or, or uh, self-organizing way that's not governed. There isn't actually a government uh, analogy that applies in the way teams work to my mind. Um, I, think, I think that the next question I'd like to ask the uh, panelists is, uh, since I've already brought up one thing you should never discuss, politics, is uh, religion. Uh, but beginning on a personal level, uh, has, uh, ha ha do you feel as a panelist that 
you're a better person for Agile. How have you changed personally? Have you, uh, can you share something, if you have something to share about that, from kind of a values standpoint, an ethics standpoint? I, I would like to really represent, it's not that Agile has brought in these values. These were all inherited in our DNA. I don't think that we can overnight change the value. For example, if you really say trust, or you know, empowerment, or mutual respect, these are all in our DNA where we have to really exhibit this. Only thing what I would really say, I come from a traditional waterfall model, and when, when the gentleman who has to come and do the evangelizing, um, to do it at a large level, he was just thinking that I will be the first impediment to really go in for this change. And he thought that since I come from ISO and CMM background, he thought that I'll be the toughest person. But I just really think of it seven years back when we started the journey. It was very difficult to come from command and control to collaborate with the team and then do it. I think it, it gives us magnificent result. And I see we have a lot of potential to learn from our peers and subordinates and everybody. And especially, I would say, in, in fact, I really do the transaction even from a personal level at, uh, at home as well. So you really need to learn a lot from everybody around you so that you have a feeling that you're not the ultimate to take a decision on your own and, and unanimously and then really say that, yes, I've concluded this is the decision. I think it really helped me a lot to really be there, uh, to be an agile person, you know, what I am today. I, I would say personally when I was quite young, uh, I was always right. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I've changed my mind about that. Uh, but I recognize that when I disagree with somebody now, it's usually because we have different backgrounds. And now I'm more willing to sort of understand where, where is our different assumption. You're a smart person, I'm a smart person. Uh, if we're coming to a different conclusion, there must be a really reason behind that. And I think part of my maturity and Agile has certainly helped this is let's explore why we disagree on something rather than talk about my position versus your position. Let's try to get to the root cause of that. And I'm, I'm, much, I'm much more fluent in doing that. I don't get upset when, I'm, when you disagree with me now. I probe. And I think that's sort of the growth I've got with Agile. Is I feel very comfortable probing in this environment. Adding to Fred, uh, one thing that's interesting is you know, I, I always thought it should be you know, one person's way or another person's way, and there is no middle ground. But uh, what Agile personally has given to me is uh, what I call the safe uh, failing experiment mode where you know because you are working on such tiny pieces you're not making the you know a huge decision and that has to get you have to get it right you know you are you get into this mindset that you know let's try this let's experiment this and uh, you know either my way or your way does not really matter as far as we can experiment it and adapt and that's something that i think has had a profound impact on the way i try to do things these days One thing that, that I would like to add to this is, um, in many ways, technology can be a, a solitary business. Um, in, in, in many organizations, they actually talk about a track uh, that, that someone like me is on as the individual contributor. And you know, people are looked at for what they can do by themselves. And I think one of the transitions, personally, that, that I've made, uh, particularly coming pr from an academic environment into the, the one that I'm currently in, is the extent to which you have to transition your mental model from always relying on yourself and always working by yourself to actually relying on a team and working in the context of, of, of a team. And you know, it doesn't necessarily have, have to do with, with um, how I do my job differently, but just the expectations um, that I won't be alone in doing what I'm doing. Uh, I will be doing it with other people who are motivated by the same objectives and, and we're out um, as a team to try to achieve something and we will resolve our differences um, by talking about them and we will resolve our different approaches um, through looking at what works and experimenting. So I, I think that's, that's been, that, that's been a, a significant transition for me. I was going to make pretty much the same uh, observation that Fred had made, but I just wanted to tie it back to a, a, a story from Star Trek, and it's a theme for me now. The, in the sixth Star Trek movie, we saw exactly that when uh, Captain Kirk invited the Klingons onto the ship, and they started talking with each other and saw that there was great similarities, although some differences as well that they could learn from. So 
Um, I would want to leave you with that. I think it's difficult for some of us to talk about ourselves and to be vulnerable and to talk about how we've changed and what might have not been so good about how we were before. Uh, and I appreciate the, uh, the, the effort that every panelist made. I'm going to ask the same question again uh, because I'm not really completely satisfied with the answers. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask again, more clearly if I can. I didn't probably define the acceptance criteria very well. Uh, wasn't being test driven. I, I want to know really personally how you have changed and if you feel you're a better person uh, by whatever value system you, you might choose. I don't want to impose anything, but uh, I, I felt, Rebecca, you responded pretty well to that, uh, just to name names. Uh, but feel free to, to take the mic again. And you're, no one's obligated, but I just wanted to pose the question again as sort of an advocate for the audience. So I will disagree. Um, <laughs> I would say, I, I think I, with Agile, I've actually found my, my uh, emotional home, the one that sort of fits my way of working best. Um, I think that's why I gravitated it quite early and don't want to leave it. Uh, so I don't think it's, it's changed me, but it's kind of matched much better what, how I choose to work versus processes I grew up with with waterfall. Am I off the hook since I have actually got it right? You're <laughs> off the hook. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't think that I would say Agile has changed my way of working, but it emphasized the collaboration part more, and it helped me to really reach out to people to collaborate more and then take consensus based on the voting. So that, that's a change I would say. I've uh, actually, to take it a little further, I've actually gone a full circle. So when, when I started, I, I really wanted to you know, collaborate with people, but I was working in environments where uh, collaboration was not the thing to do. You would sit by yourself and you would be a hero and you would do stuff and you would get appraisals. So, you know, that's how I started. I went into organizations then where, you know, collaboration was the way to work and then we really brought in agile methods to kind of help us do that. And uh, now that I'm a startup founder, uh, or, you know, struggling guy, uh, I rather much prefer working by myself than collaborating with other people because I think it's a huge waste of time. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that's an interesting observation that we need to respect. Um, I think Agile has helped me to uh, under understand and appreciate the human side of things uh, a lot better than I did um, in you know before Agile. Uh, very similar to the uh, ongoing struggle that Commander Data and Mr. Spock both had in Star Trek. <laughs> Excellent. I appreciate that. Thanks, everyone, for their effort to, uh, to go a little deeper. Uh, I think iterations work well, uh, sprints work well, and sometimes doing things repeatedly work well, even it may, it may seem a little redundant. Um, I want to talk a little bit, uh, ask people to talk a little bit now about uh, culture. We're here in India. Uh, some of us are from India, some of us are not. Uh, I'm from the U.S. I live in France. Uh, I've been living in France for six years. I've worked with India quite a bit. Uh, and a question in my mind for some, quite some time has been, is, is Agile a uh, culturally sensitive uh, framework and to the extent that there's a value system in Agile, uh, does it apply equally in all cultures? Does it apply equally in India in the same way or in other countries? Uh, so uh, I'd like to see what you have to say. I think culture is overrated, extremely overrated. Uh, especially country culture, because there's no such thing called country culture. Uh, I'll give you a small example. I used to work for a large sweatshop, and, uh, okay, sorry, I didn't mean that. I worked for a large sweatshop, <laughs> and uh, the way things would work over there would be, you know, you go in the morning and you do your job, and somebody needs help, and you just put your head around, and you say, oh, I'm really busy now, you know. Uh, and I just don't want to help anybody because I want to be the hero. I want to get my stuff done. And uh, I would take the same guys out for, so I used to organize hikes for people, so I would take them on the weekends for treks. So I would take the exact same guys who would not want to collaborate, who would not want to help, who would not move a bone until their managers told them to do so. I would take them for hikes. And, you know, if somebody runs out of water, immediately everybody else offers their bottle of water to help people. Uh, 
somebody slips and falls, you know, without a manager being there telling them to go help the person, immediately people help, uh, you know, somebody else. So this kind of struck me really hard that it's the exact same person with the same DNA working in a company wouldn't do a single thing unless being told by the manager and the same person here completely self-organizing and helping, going out of their way, you know, giving their last drop of water to somebody else uh, when nobody's demanding that and it's like, what is culture? So I think company cultures do matter a lot uh, or the way the company structure and value people and they rate people matter a lot lot more than the ethnic background you come from. I strongly respect diversity, but I think it's overrated. I have totally, uh, uh, totally an opposite view on this. Definitely it is Indian culture. I, I would really talk about people coming forward to take any responsibility. Primarily, if you look at it, they are more attuned to, you know, take orders. Um, you know, I'm, I'm telling the truth. My, maybe people, those who are sitting here, could have, uh, you know, changed the whole way of working in terms of making orders. But most of the time, we are attuned to really obey the parents, obey the, you know, elders. And, you know, we have been taught not to say no to anything, even politely. So we have the opportunity to say er for, for everything, everything which is questioned, we say yes. And then, of course, miserably fail. And that's why we are really in this uh, kind of situation in, in terms of outsourcing some time. So is it, is it a culture barrier? Probably yes, the way we have brought it. And this, this side thing that slowly things are changing up and giving them the empowerment to really bring in the best out of them. And the second part is that when you, when you really talk about how they would really help, it's nothing to do with the culture, it is the passion. Supposing they are passionate about doing that, they would give the last drop of water or bring some more water and give them also. But when it comes to the question of competition within the job, they really want to be the best, which, which is nothing to do with India, it's all over. It's all over. Uh, I've had the fortune to work with uh, people in many countries and working in Agile. Uh, I do think there is some differences by country. Uh, I remember my first time being in India, uh, I was teaching a class. I walk into the class of brand new freshers and they all stood up. <laughs> and I, I remember thinking, oh my God, I have to get them to the point where they challenge me and then we'll have valuable employees. That, that was something that I just completely unexpected. Uh, it was very much part of this, trying to show respect, I understand that, but you need to challenge what I'm thinking if you're gonna be a productive employee. It didn't take them too long to learn that, however. This is not something you cannot learn, unlearn very quickly. So I think one of the things I've seen, particularly in India in the last you know, five to 10 years since I started coming here, is the entrepreneurs are starting to come forward. They're starting to make their own decisions. They're not necessarily being driven by their parents to go take a job with a big company and get a big title and get a nice spouse. That's not necessarily the priority uh, as, as the generations come moving forward. Uh, so I think it's something that's, that you start a culture, at a cultural point, you're starting there, but it's very, very easy in a very short time to move off of that and move into a more productive environment. I do feel somewhat compelled to challenge the diversity is overrated <laughs> comment. <laughs> I'm sure, Naresh, you were expecting that. Um, because I, I, do, I, I do agree with you that, that trying to say point blank, um, you are from India, therefore you behave this way, you are from the US, therefore you behave that way, is, is a mistake. And it's a mistake that is often made. However, I, I do see that when you combine people from different backgrounds, uh, different countries of origin, different genders, that different things happen, more creative things happen. And so there, there, is, there is something that, um, you know, it's not necessarily country of origin, it's not necessarily background, there are all kinds of things that go into this. Uh, but trying, trying to solve a complex problem that nobody understands, it's far easier to do it with, if you've got a group of people who think differently, um, trying to attack the problem in different ways rather than a group of people who are all looking at the problem the same way. Because if they don't see it the first time, they're, they're not going to be able to solve it, just continuing to look at it in much the same way. Yeah, culture does count, and there are significant differences around the world. So trying to get Agile working in California with the surfer dude programming culture is a bit different than trying to get it running in a Central European country that was blessed with Soviet rule for 70 years 
and with people who had to worry about their neighbors and families selling them out. Um, there's not a lot of trust in those, in those uh, situations still. Um, and those, those are two extremes, let alone differences between India and China and the Philippines and Canada. And you know, even the differences between Canada and the United States can be interesting sometimes. Um, so I think we need to respect that, just like on Star Trek, they respect the differences between uh, the Vulcans and the humans and the, uh, the Klingons. Fantastic. Uh, and, and I think also in Star Trek, uh, which is an important theme, Yes. You should, you should, whenever you go to a world, you should leave it as, you shouldn't interfere with its culture. Try not to, but they always did. They always did, <laughs> accidentally. Bastards. So. And it was always 20th century Earth, somehow. But anyway. <laughs> and there are always a lot of beautiful women running around in, in, in terror. Outfits, yes. So, uh, speaking of women, uh, I'm interested in, in gender differences. So, uh, men and women are here together. Uh, there's no fighting going on, there's nothing uh, untoward going on that I can see. Everyone's keeping their hands to themselves. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, gender in the workplace and how Agile uh, may affect that. On our panel we have two uh, strong leaders who are women, uh, who have, have key roles in the organizations they work in. Uh, they've gotten there probably not through an easy pathway. Uh, at the beginning of today we heard a story about uh, women uh, who are horribly, uh, horribly abused. Uh, and I think we all know that uh, women have had a hard time culturally in most cultures uh, that we, we uh, belong to. Uh, so I'm interested if Agile is a way to make the world better in this sense. Uh, comments, feedback? There, there's some interesting debates going on in the, uh, around the question of, of gender diversity, uh, particularly as it applies to women leaders. Um, do we need to turn into men in order to be effective uh, as leaders? You know, um, do, do we need to be um, brusque and do we need to be um, ice cold and unemotional and, and do we need to be different than who we are and to, to succeed in this quote unquote man's world. Um, and there's actually a lot of research that, that, that shows that the most successful women leaders are the ones that stay true to who they are rather than trying to turn them in, themselves into something that they are not. Um, in the short term, that can be a problem. Um, in, in the long run, though, nobody can, 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 play, uh, can play a role that they're not suited for and sustain it over time. I do think one aspect of, of the emphasis on Agile, just the extent to which the, the role of individuals and people are being paid more attention to, is something that does help. In addition, when we look at uh, the, the history of um, uh, young girls and young women choosing to go into the software profession, you know, as long as there's the stereotype of, of, the, of the individual who doesn't wash very often and, and always is working in a basement and never talks to anybody, that's not, not considered to be a terribly attractive profession. Uh, the extent to which how we approach software development now is a whole lot more about talking to people uh, rather than sitting in a corner with headphones on and perhaps the only light coming from the screen. Uh, it, it, it has changed the environment. And oh, by the way, I also don't believe all the low stereotypes are, are true or have been true. You know, uh, that there are certainly individuals, but um, the, the vast majority of the software people I know are actually quite uh, nicely functioning human beings. So, um, but, but I do think that one of the things that, that will help is by emphasizing that this is as much a, a, a people problem as a technology problem it can start to give us some ammunition to say, well, women still aren't suited for math and computer science because they're just too emotional and not logical enough. And unfortunately, I still hear that. I don't think for the gender difference, Agile is the solution. But I, I, I have a feeling that a female working as a scrum master, when, when they have the ability to collaborate more, I think, from the yesteryear's project management technique with the Agile, probably they are much better off in terms of interacting and doing the job well. When you really talk about leadership dimension at a higher level, definitely we have the same set of challenges working with all the 
male chauvinists. It's, it's tough. It's not that easy. Agile is not the solution. I think, as you said, it's after all people. We interact with people and then, you know, get to the level of, uh, you know, our competency and then show how we are capable of doing the job what is assigned to us probably in a much better way and, you know, with much velocity. And I think that these are the things which is going to really help us to grow as leaders rather than just the agile alone. So I, had, I got a degree in 1973 in computer science. Half the class was female. Uh, something happened between then and now that I find actually quite disturbing. Um, but what the silver lining is, I look across this audience, and yes, there are not that many women in here, but there are many, many more than I see when I go to a conference in the US. So whatever you guys are doing, keep doing it. Keep encouraging your female colleagues to participate. And perhaps Agile is part of the answer, but perhaps it's something else you guys are doing. Uh, by all means, please continue. And tell the rest of the world what it is. You want us to continue with this kind of mix? I want more women, thank oh. you. <laughs> I want more women too, but <laughs> for different reasons, yes. Andorians or? Uh... Andorians would work for me. Um, <laughs> I'm glad Rebecca started talking about stereotypes because I was really struggling for a, uh, an analogy. And I think Agile does open up uh, opportunities for us to start breaking stereotypes because we can start working more with, you know, we are working more with the business people. We are showing that we are just normal people with, you know, just like everybody else. And we saw this on Star Trek, the original series where they had these little opportunities to break stereotypes, such as the first interracial kiss on television, such as the first uh, implied sex scene where somebody didn't have to keep both one of their feet on the floor during filming. And these seem like trivial things now, but this was <laughs> radical stuff in the, in the 60s and early 70s, so at least for the United States. But anyways, uh, so I thought I would share that with you. So Agile helps to break stereotypes, and I think that's a very good thing. The, uh, back when I just finished my uh, engineering and I was uh, up for uh, campus recruitment, I, I went in for a company's interview and uh, they had a you know, group discussion during the uh, interview. And the topic of the group discussion was, should there be reservation for women? And I was like, boy, that's a really hard topic because I don't have uh, opinion either ways. I'm, I, I don't really have enough experience to comment on it. So basically when my turn came, I said, you know, uh, the lady who was conducting the, uh, the group discussion, I, I basically pointed her to say, I think she's here because of her capability and not because of uh, reservation. And uh, I got the job. <laughs> <laughs> There, there's a theme in some of the questions that you've been asking, and I'm going to synthesize uh, a couple of the questions I've just looked at with the next question. Uh, but first, I'll respond to the one I just asked as well. Uh, I, th I think that uh, Agile as a, as a framework or as a set of values, as a way of being, uh, is respectful, collaborative, and uh, uh, levels the playing field uh, for, all, for all people. So whether the discrimination previously was gender, racial, ethnic, or your position in the hierarchy, I believe that Agile helps, personally, or I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing it. Uh, it's a reason I'm passionate about Agile. So uh, I, I, I hope, at least, that it's making things better, but I, I also uh, appreciated what Rebecca said earlier this morning about realism, uh, about uh, uh, seeing the way things really are, and, and I think there really are lots of problems that remain uh, interculturally uh, from a gender standpoint, and based on uh, authority. So the, the, the other question I wanted to ask, which is based, as I say, on some, some questions from the audience, has to do with uh, power distance, as it's some, sometimes described, management structure, hierarchy, uh, and the relationships between people who um, control uh, one another's destiny to some extent. Uh, managers can hire or fire you, and when you're fired, you don't have money, in which case you may not have food. So uh, it, it, we, we heard this morning uh, about a horrible form of uh, slavery. Uh, 
but to some extent, uh, organizations may uh, have a, a, a diluted version of a similar form of slavery. Uh, I don't think that most employees feel that they're prostitutes. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they may not feel completely free. They may not feel that they can do exactly what they want. Uh, and uh, they're, even in agile organizations, are still managers who are probably abusing their position of, of power. So I'm curious about uh, the, the, the questions that have been asked. How do you feel Agile is impacting the upper levels of management and the, the hierarchy in the organizations that you work with? Uh, do you have examples of, of improvements, or is it the same old, same old? Is Agile not really tackling the difficult problems of uh, hierarchy and authority? I'll go first. Uh, I worked for a company where they had very strong hierarchy, and uh, you know you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to do a thing unless your manager approved it, and his manager approved it, or her manager approved it, and it went. Thank you. Uh, so. I've just repeating what I said, I, I worked for a company where the hierarchy was really strong and uh, things wouldn't happen unless you had, you went through the whole chain of approval, you know, the chain of responsibility pattern till final approval from the God would be given. And uh, one thing I noticed is in that company when they started implementing Agile, uh, things really did not change much. Uh, things did not really change much except uh, people started doing more of lip service saying, you know, we, we, we are going to let self-organization and people are going to decide, by the way, you're working on this. Uh, and uh, this needs to be done uh, yesterday. Uh, so, you know, that organization, I lost hope. I, I didn't think they would change at all. Uh, but then a strong leader came into the organization. And uh, this person, I was surprised, would actually be, you know, you would be shocked to find him sometimes sitting next to you and actually doing his work. And he was a CEO of a really, really huge company. And just looking at him, I think the whole hierarchy in the organization suddenly changed. People were making more decisions on their own. The whole, uh, so what I'm getting at is, again, uh, I think Agile does make a difference, but trying to push Agile does not help change the hierarchy unless you have somebody really strong with a vision who can you know, lead by example rather than lip service. I think oftentimes abuse within an organization occurs because people feel isolated from each other. Um, so one of the things I've seen happen in, in agile organizations is because we tend to sit together, because we tend to tear the walls down between the cubes, uh, you're, you're working very closely with your colleagues. Uh, and so, when, when so it's very hard to create an abusive situation without everybody noticing it as well. Uh, so it may move a little bit quieter, but I've, I've seen situations where uh, teams have fired their project manager because he felt the project manager was too domineering and, and too pushing, trying to tell them how to do their jobs. The team said, this is not working for us, and as a whole, they went forward and got him kicked out. Uh, I think the openness associated with Agile, the collaboration associated with Agile, is going to make it a little more difficult for the abuse to occur. I do think it will still be occurring in other ways. Uh, thank you. So another question that I have unrelated to uh, religion or politics or gender uh, issues or uh, hierarchy it has to do more with physics, uh, space and time. So uh, in particular with respect to space, uh, we're here in India and we're talking about people who are maybe working in other remote locations. The management might be in the US or, or Europe or it might be local. Uh, the team members might be dispersed. Uh, many of us have dealt with working uh, in Agile in a distributed environment. We have different uh, feelings about that. And uh, it, things don't always work the way we'd like. I'm curious about your view on does Agile work in a distributed environment and differentiating dispersed teams from distributed co-located teams. So you could have multiple teams, each one is co-located or a team with members in many locations. Uh, the nature of the interaction side of individuals in the Agile Manifesto, individuals and their interactions. How are interactions across space and time uh, and ideas that, uh, that you have to share with the, the audience that would improve trust, improve uh, results, improve culture uh, based on your experience? I, I would like to really state here, it's a very interesting dimension for us. Most of the time, they want Indian teams to be agile. 
and all the, probably we work with a lot of uh, French colleagues in French projects. It's very tough. They may not be agile and they, leave alone being agile. They won't even follow even simple scrum practices, but still they really want India to be up and running in everything in agile. So it is a, I would say that it is a diverse way of working with them in terms of some team in India working in agile and, and our expected team in on-site not being agile. So this was the case and then of course you have a customer element where he is totally not being agile. This really gave us a lot of issues and that's where as Valtec we really got into the customer location and also with our country colleagues to really go in for agile and then drive them the some of the important practices where they have to really go in and and probably after six to nine months, it gave us some result. But during those six, ten, six to ten months, it was a real period for India to struggle hard because we were also in the transition stage and people were not able to really understand and more of command and control from French colleagues. And it's, it's not an easy way, I'm telling you. So I've, I've always worked on distributed teams. <laughs> didn't have the opportunity to always be co-located, so I've always worked on distributed teams except for a few. And uh, I would conclude that distributed development in general, agile or not, is hard. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard uh, for various reasons, but the, most, the, the, the thing that really stands out for me is lack of trust. Uh, because if I don't know somebody, I, it's very unlikely that I'll trust them. And if I don't have trust, then all the visibility issues and all the other uh, issues that we talk about, uh, you know, start surfacing. Agile, again, does help in some of those because you're iterating, you get to see faster feedback, you help, you give an opportunity for better collaboration. So it improves that trust factor, but unless you focus explicitly on building trust, distributed development becomes extremely difficult. Uh, I did have an opportunity to work for a startup company where we were all co-located and, uh, you know, I. At that point, I, 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 I actually much preferred being distributed. Uh, the reason was that uh, I was, so it was four of us who were kind of the next line uh, management uh, after the founder, and then we had a whole teams of people. And anytime we had an idea, if one of us went to the founder, he would shoot us down because he was way too smart than any one of us were. And what we ended up doing was then four of us would go together. So while one person is talking, the rest three would be thinking what, is, what would be the next question. So we could actually keep up with the founder. And that also became really hard to keep up. So then I basically went back to first writing blogs or writing an email, uh, getting all the feedback out there between the four of us, and then basically sending him a link to the blog or uh, the article and say, read this, I'm about to come and have a discussion about this. And five minutes later, I would say, OK, go ahead and implement it. So I didn't really have to go to him, and I would much prefer you know, being distributed and work with him. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you need to find better employers, dude. Hey, you do have a better employer now. You're self-employed. <laughs> there you go. Uh, one of the things that I do, I run industry-level surveys, because I, I prefer to have fact-based discussions as opposed to religion-based discussions. And one of the great myths of Agile is that um, we work in co-located teams. And this is not the norm. Uh, you know, m many of us do, without a doubt. But this is the, minor the minority of Agile teams are, co are truly co-located. And you know, particularly when you define co-location as having your key stakeholders in the room with you as well. And this is something we need to have more coherent discussions about. And because, you know, even if you're working in cubes, you're suddenly distributed. Um, and there, there's a, a measurable loss of, of productivity, of ability to collaborate effectively, of your success rate. And this is true regardless of paradigm, by the way. Um, because I, I've, I've looked at this issue across paradigms. I want to be able to compare paradigms. It's an interesting question. It would be, does traditional work better for a distributed team than Agile? And the answer is no, it does not. But it could have. Who knows, right? Because um, we didn't really have solid data on that. So. Distributed, geographic distributed agile is far more.